Amen. Open up your Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And look at verse 9. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. It says, Who has saved us? Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. Now listen to this. He saved us, not according to us wanting to get saved. Oh, I got to get saved. I got to get saved. He saved us for a purpose. He saved us for a purpose. He saved us for a purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. He already had purposed that you were supposed to do something for him. Some people say, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. He's got every plan, every purpose for every person already laid out. You need to find out what your purpose is. Amen. Now, I have heard some people say in their lifetime to me over the last 30 years say well pastor I you know I'm, I'm not going to be following the, the Lord real close I mean I'll, I'll show up to church from time to time but I think the Lord was kind of pressing on my heart that he wanted me to do something and like go overseas and minister and so I, I just refuse to do that so I'm not going to try to find out what his will is for my life because I don't want to know and when I hear things like that that is so devastating because here's what the Lord says he says you need to understand your sense of mission and your sense of purpose because if you do not know that you won't know where you fit some people go to church and they say well I think I'll go to that church well I think I'll go to that church do you know that God already has a plan and a church for you to be in you're not here by accident it's a plan of God it's the purpose of God he's having something for you to receive from him now here's what it says and let me give you this information in the 30 years that I've been saved, I've had lots of people that always, I, I've led many people to the Lord, and I've had people at the airport, I've had people at, at gas stations say, oh, oh, Pastor Michael, Pastor Michael, oh, praise God, hey, he's the one that, he, he's the one that saved me. No, no, I didn't. I didn't save anybody. <laughs> <laughs> if I could save anybody, I'd save myself. Are you with me? You can't save anybody. It was Jesus that did the saving. Now, I might have taught a, mesh, uh, a word that, that they could hear the things of God and they were led to the Lord, but I didn't save them. I don't have the power to save. It's only Jesus. Amen. He saved us for a purpose. Look at Romans 8 and 28. Oh, I love this verse. Romans 8 and 28. If you've not looked in there lately, you need to see what this says. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good. How many know that verse? Amen. We have probably quoted that verse. Oh, everything's going to everything's gonna work together for good. It's all going to work together for good. You may have misread, misread the whole thing because you didn't finish reading the scripture. It says all things work together for good to those who love God. To those that love God. You know that kind of love there is the word agape. It doesn't mean that you love God that you know, well I love, uh, I love pizza. I love my dog. It's I love God without question. There's no question. I'm doing whatever God tells me to do. This is a different kind of love. I love God. Those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. What does that mean? You're doing the will of God according to the purpose that he's laid out for your life. Do you know that there's... Everything is going to work out exactly like he said when you're doing the things he called you to do according to his purpose. Now some people are not following the purpose of God because they don't want to know fully what the will is of God because they want to do their own thing. But this says he called us and he says it's not this situation he called you out of. It's not because you were such a, a, a sinner and you got saved. You got saved because he needed you. He's got a purpose for you. Amen. So he called you to what? Come on. He called you to what? To purpose. Come on. He called you to what? Purpose. He called you to what? purpose if he called you to the what he saved you for what purpose there's a purpose you're saved now this is a strategic plan of God it is your role in the body of Christ if you see what he said he likes your personality 
Now, no, it no, doesn't matter what anybody else says about you. doesn't matter what anybody thinks about you. God likes your personality. He's called your personality because nobody else could do what you've been called to do. He called you because of your personality, because of your gifting. He called you because of your abilities. He called you. You may say, well, you don't know my history. He called you because of your history. Your history has made you the exact candidate that's ready to be used by God for a specific purpose that he has called you to. Amen. Now here's something important. I want you to look at 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. 1 Peter 4. Beloved, don't think it's strange that you're going through a fiery trial. <laughs> Don't think it's strange. People go like this all the time. I don't deserve this. I didn't do anything. I don't know why this is happening to me. Here's what it says. Come on. This is in the Word. It's written down. This is a word from God. He says, don't think it's strange that you're going through a fiery trial. This is not something that's go. This didn't take the Holy Ghost by surprise. Jesus and God not sitting in heaven going, I didn't know this was going to happen. <laughs> This fiery trial did not take the Holy Ghost by surprise. And don't think it's, it's, it's amazing that I'm having to go through this because I didn't do anything. He didn't have to do anything. If you're born again, you're going to go through fiery trials. Amen. Amen. This is going to help somebody. Why are you going through fiery trials? Why are you going through fiery trials? He's molding you for something. If you're dealing with something, it's because you're going to be able to minister to someone that's actually had to go through the same kind of thing you've been through. Amen. Amen. Some people say, well, I, 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 the only thing I've had to do is for 10 years, we really had to struggle in our life and had to work out our relationship. And my wife and I had to really go through a lot to be able to be where we are. I don't think God's going to ever be able to use us. Honey, you went through all that so you could help somebody get through what they're going through in their life. Some people say, well, I don't know how God's going to use me. He chose you. He made you the perfect candidate by what you've been through. Amen. And he said this, I'm molding you for a purpose. He made you the way he made you. Amen. In Exodus chapter 4, you get to about verse 10 and Moses says this. Moses said to the Lord, Lord, look, I, I, I'm not eloquent with, 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 with my speech. I, I, I can't keep my, 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 my sentences uh, working pro 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 properly. He said, I, I, I'm slow to speech and, 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 and I've got a, uh, I got a bad mouth. And the Lord said to him, didn't I make your mouth? <laughs> I, this didn't take me by surprise. This is nothing new. I know you had that mouth. That's why I called you. Because you can't count on your eloquence of speech. You can't count on your, your, your great oration. It's got to be the Lord that does it because you are flawed. Amen. Now some people need to understand this. He made you the way he made you. This is part of your purpose. This is part of what he called you for. He considered your background. He considered your flaws. He considered your limitations. But he still chose you. And some people say, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. He chose you. If you've been saved, you've been chosen. If you've been saved, you have a purpose. If you've been saved, you've been called. This is the word of the Lord. He says, no one else can do what I called you to do better. In Acts chapter 28. Oh, I love this verse. Acts chapter 28. And you get through Acts chapter 27. Paul goes through all kinds of trouble. He's in a boat. For heaven's sake, the boat is out on the sea. The boat goes through a, a big old storm. The boat's being tossed to and fro. But the word of the Lord comes to him and says, nobody will be lost. Amen. The boat's going to be a mess. You won't be able to use that thing again. But nobody's going to be lost. Anybody ever been in an accident? Yes. And nobody got hurt? Yes. The car's a wreck. But nobody got hurt. You didn't go, oh, 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 I'm glad you're okay, but my car, my car. You went, oh, honey, I'm glad you're all right. <laughs> because that is exactly what happened to Paul. The ship got wrecked. I mean, for heaven's sake, the entire back end of the ship got stuck, and the stern got messed up and broken into pieces. But all the people made it to the shore. They finally got on the shore. Here they are at the shore of Malta. And now, when they had escaped this big accident... They found out that there was an island called Malta and the natives showed an unusual kindness to all these prisoners that had been on the boat. 
And they showed an unusual kindness. And they kindled a fire. And they were probably cooking a little something, getting them ready to be welcome. And Paul, because he's not a man that would sit down and watch this happen, he said, you know, if they're making a fire, I'm going to go get some firewood. Because he should be like a lot of us that say, no matter what's going on, I'm going to make the best out of the situation. So he went to get some firewood, and he's got a big old pile of firewood, and he comes over to the fire. He's trying to kindle the fire, and because the rain had fallen, because it was cold, Paul gathered a bunch of sticks and laid them on a fire, and a snake comes out and grabs a hold of his hand. And Paul goes, that's enough. Shakes it off. Shake it off. Come on, everybody do like, shake it off. This ought to be your motto when the devil comes on. I rebuke you. <laughs> Situations come, you ought to go, that's enough of that. I just about had it. You ought to shake it off. I'm telling you, this is the word of the Lord to you today. And he shook it off into the fire. Praise God. It fastened on his hands, but the creature was hanging on. And no doubt they thought this is a murderer. But in verse 5, he shook the thing off right into the fire. Hallelujah. And no harm came to him at all. Now, Paul did not respond to the situation, but he responded to the word of God that had already been given to him. No man will be hurt. If you got a word from the Lord, you can do anything. If you don't have a word from the Lord, you're just a wandering generality. You need to become a meaningful specific. If God's given you a word, then hang on to that word because that's the word of the Lord to you. Amen. And he shook it off into the fire. The word said, you will not die. In Isaiah 26, you get to verse 3. And the Lord says this. He will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Amen. He'll keep you in perfect peace. You know when we get messed up, it's when you let your mind wander. Come on. There's some people say, well, my, I couldn't get control of my mind. I just couldn't sleep at all. Yeah, because you didn't have control of your mind. Your mind needs to stay in perfect peace when it's focused on the Lord. You want to go to sleep? Focus on the Lord. Yeah. Focus on Him. And you'll go right out. Hallelujah. You trust in the Lord. You need to take the cares of this world. I don't care what's dealing with, what you're dealing with. I don't care if it's financial. I don't care if it's your children. I don't care if it's somebody else in the relation. I don't care what it is. And you got to go... <clears throat> That's enough of that. I'm not going to think about that. Just shake it off. Come on, everybody. Shake it off. Come on. Shake it off. Shake it off. We shake it off because it should not affect you in any way. You've been called for his purpose. He reached down into your world with your problems and your flaws and your situation and your limitations. And he grabbed a hold of you and he pulled you out for his purpose. And he took the circumstances and the situations and he tells you, I'm going to tell you, don't let them affect you. No weapon that's been formed against you is going to prosper. What we do is we go, oh, you don't know what I'm dealing with. I got a call from the IRS. We hear those three letters and we start running for the hills. It's like I heard from the IRS. We'll go to him with G-O-D. Come on. You back up me against the wall with three letters and I'll use my three letters. Come on. This is the form of the Lord. We need to hear what the Lord says. He says the sense of purpose that we need, no matter what the circumstances, we got to shake it off. You cannot stand unless you're formulated on the sense of purpose and the mission that he's put in your life. When you've got that mission, I don't care what's going on. You be on a plane. You're riding on a plane. The plane's all rocking and everybody's hands are turning a different color because they're hanging on to the seats. And they're, they're just rocking. And people are looking at you and they're saying, are you all right? Yeah, I'm in perfect peace because my mind has stayed on him. What do you mean? Well, I know what the word of the Lord was to me. He said, I'm going to go and preach to the other nations. I've got several places to go. I've already seen the vision. So this is not the end. Well, what if it's the pilot's end? It's not the pilot's end because he can't go until I go. This whole thing's going to go where I say it's going to go, and it's not my time. Amen. Because you have a purpose and you have a destiny according to the Word of God. You're on a mission. The mission of the Lord has been called for your life. God has a plan for your life. Listen to me. He sent you. Circumstances and flaws make no difference. He sent you. 
consumed by mistakes, make no difference, he sent you. I don't care what your past looks like, you've been called to use that past for his purpose. Amen. God has laid out for you what he's decided for you to do. Look at Philippians chapter 1. Amen. Philippians chapter 1. You get to verse 6. It says, Being confident of this very thing, that he that began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So when people say, well, I'm going through a real bad time. Makes no difference. He's still going to get the work done. Right. Amen. Amen. His call and purpose is not with repentance. Right. He's got a call for your life. Hallelujah. Look at Luke chapter 10. Amen. I'm having a good time anyway. Luke chapter 10. You get to verse 1. It says this. And after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and he sent them out two by two why in the world would God send out these 70 people two by two two by two because there's something that only works when you have the power of agreement some devils will not be moved unless you move them by the power of agreement and the problem is God's called you to something and you need the power of agreement in your life. There's some situations that can't be broken, some yokes that can't be moved unless you have the power of agreement. Now I don't have time to teach all that this morning, but the enemy is trying to stop your gifting for your prayer partner. Some people are called to a church and they're supposed to be in a corporate prayer situation. Called to that church to work corporately in prayer. Pray in agreement. But they won't participate because of something that's in their mind. The devil's been robbing them of being able to be a part because they're not going to coordinate. I don't like that person. I can't make it during that time. It's not good for me. I don't see how that's going to work. He's robbing you of your prayer partner. And the situation is not moving on your behalf because you're not getting acquainted with your partner in prayer. Amen. And the enemy's trying to stop your gifting and break down the partnership of prayer. It's happening in marriages all over. They were called to be partners in prayer. And the devil's doing his best to try to break that up so they don't even pray together. Never let them stand together because the weapon that has been formed against them will prosper. That one devil that can't be moved unless it's used by the prayer of agreement still prospers in their house. And they go, how'd they do that? Because they're not in agreement with one another. There's so much strife going on, they can't even form an agreement. They're fighting with each other instead of fighting the devil. Church services are like that all over the United States where people disagree on certain things. I was in a church where they were so adamant about what they were doing. They were just adamant. They had a whole board and I sat on the board and they were deciding whether things would happen or not in the church based on what that board decided. Whether it was convenient or not for that board. Made no difference what the word of the Lord said. Made a difference what the board said. So the word of the Lord came and a person said, well I want to give the church a grand piano. Thousands of dollars worth of a grand piano, only been used for a few years, brand new, look good. Set it in the sanctuary, take over that little piano that we've got, the little Cracker Jacks box piano, and put this big grand piano in there instead. No strings attached. And they had a vote among the 11 to decide whether or not it should come to the church. And one man said, who's going to tune it? Another man said, well, we'll have to change the atmospheric pressure in the room to try to associate the proper usage of that piano outside. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> another man said, well, we'll have to buy a cover for it. And finally, another man said, how are we going to move it? We'll have to buy some kind of a, a trailer to even get the thing here or hire somebody, God forbid. And they took the vote. And it was 10 to 1. And they said, what are you holding out for? The word of the Lord. He said, do it. And they decided not to. Because it was not convenient for them. I think that many churches decide on what they're going to do for the Lord based on convenience instead of their purpose. 
They were probably called to praise and worship with a grand piano and have a super praise team and call people in from all kinds of places, but they couldn't do it because they were little thinkers. Little thinkers. I think partnerships have been messed up all over the place. They couldn't pray together. Marriages that people can't pray together. Churches where people can't pray together. There's all kinds of excuses why they can't pray together. Some yokes can only be broken by the power of agreement. So the enemy distracts in conflict instead of letting people stand up against him, they stand up against each other. We've all been caught up in this kind of working before where instead of fighting the enemy we look at flaws in one another God called you flaws and all God called you no matter what you look like God called you no matter what you smell like no matter what you sound like he called you and for you to say no way you're choosing your avenue instead of God's are you with me and the Lord said, I'm trying to tell you something. Don't let this situation be broken up by the power of agreement in disagreement. There's spiritual disagreement. And there's spiritual fighting. And there's spiritual strife. And this kind of distinction, this very kind of distraction is killing the mission. It's stopping the purpose. It's keeping churches small. I'm telling you what God's tried to do. He said to the 70, I warn you, I want you to go out, but don't you dare go out by yourself. You go out two by two. Now, do you have to really work at staying with somebody to stay in pairs? Do you know how long, how hard that is? When you're by yourself, you say, well, what do I want to eat? Yeah, I think I'll think somebody, ah, that didn't do it. Let me try something else. I mean, that didn't do it. Let me try something else. But when you're with your partner, you go, what do you want? They go, I don't know. Well, come on. How are you supposed to? You better help me now. What do you want? Because you give yourself more grace than you give your partner when they're with you. Are you with me? Because we're strifing with one another instead of coming against the enemy. The Lord is trying to help you something to get away from distractions. Distractions always come even if it's not just them, but it might also be you. Are you with me? It's distractions. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. I love this verse. 2 Timothy chapter 2. You get to verse 3. It says it like this. Therefore, endure hardness like a good soldier in Jesus Christ. Hardness. Do you know, he didn't promise that it's going to be smooth. He said endure hardness. Endure hardness. Don't fight those that are on your side. Fight against the devil. Team up to fight against the devil. They are not your enemy. Have you ever had somebody tell you, I'm not your enemy? <laughs> it's to try to help remind you you're focusing your fight on the wrong area. Amen. God called you to get the job done. It's not a matter of, do you get along? Can y'all make it along with it? You just need to get the job done. Amen. In Ezekiel... Chapter 34, Ezekiel chapter 34, and you get to 31, it says this. You are my sheep. How many know that you're the sheep of the Lord? Amen. You're the sheep of the Lord. You are sheep. You are sheep. You are my sheep. And you get to John chapter 10, he starts in verse 11, says it like this. I am the good shepherd. Now, what are you? What are you? Come on, what are you? You're sheep. What is God? Come on, what is Jesus? He's the good shepherd. You're the sheep. He's the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Isn't that powerful? But a hireling, he's not the shepherd. He's just someone that's covering. The hireling is he who is not the shepherd, but it's one who does not own the sheep. When he sees the wolf, he says, okay, I got to go now. <laughs> I'm out of here. I'll see you later. Got to go now. The sheep have small teeth. Anybody ever messed with sheep? They got little teeth made for grazing. Little sh the sheep have small teeth, but uh, not to take away, they also have small brains. <laughs> They're not connivers. They're, they're not, they don't scheme. Uh, contrary to wolves, they're connivers. They're schemers. They're tricksters. And they're also carnivores. 
Are you with me? <laughs> Sheep are grazers. They're vegetarians. Uh, but the, 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 the wolf is a hunter. And he's a flesh eater. And he's a carnivore. And he will try to eat the sheep. Let me, uh, let's say this together. He will eat the sheep. Can I say it one more time? He will eat the sheep. And Jesus said, I've called you to be sheep among the wolves. You know that he knew that you didn't have carnivorous teeth. You're not devouring wolves. The wolves are there to devour you. But he's not concerned. How come? He's the good shepherd. Here's what you ought to do when the devil comes. <laughs> you realize I'm a sheep, right? <laughs> I'm not the shepherd. Did you check out that big guy over there with the stick? <laughs> he's about to bop you on the head right here. He's, he's a good bopper right there. He's going to bop you on the head. Because it's not your fight. But we take on the fight instead of letting him do the fighting. He's the good shepherd. He's carrying the, the, the rod. The Bible says, my rod and my staff... They comfort me. No wonder they comfort me. He's standing there watching guard over you with a rod and a staff. Come on. Come on. Touch the sheep. Come on. A little closer. Come on. You get a little closer. I'm going to bop you in the head. This is what he's trying to do. He's there to protect you. Amen? The Bible says that the greatest soldiers, the greatest soldiers are the ones that endure hardness. They endure hardness. But let me add a little bit. If you're a good soldier... You figure out how to be effective in discomfort. Mm, athletes that are great athletes, they figured out how to be effective in discomfort. You see a great athlete said, he was just hurt, man. He just broke his ankle. He's back in the game. Because he figured out how to be effective in discomfort. If you're going to be a good soldier, you got to figure out how to be effective in discomfort. You know where we've messed up? We think it's all about comfort. We think it's all about my peace, my priority, myself. But if we get caught up in ourself, we miss love. The Bible says it's not about you. It's not about your discomfort. Here we go. Shake it off. <laughs> Shake it off. If you're going to do what the Lord called you to do, shake it off. He said, I'm not, it's not about your comfort level. It's about your mission. It's about your purpose. And you've got to be effective while you're uncomfortable. Amen. Yeah. This is the strong word of the Lord. He's called us to shake it off. No matter what you're dealing with, shake it off. I don't care if the circumstances think it's got you, <clears throat> shake it off. The devils think he's got you backed against the wall, shake it off. He's, taking a, he's coming with snarling teeth. You might see the devil coming over the hill. And you know, sometimes the Bible says when the, the demonic spirits come, they don't come alone. Sometimes they come with seven words. And the big snarly teeth are hanging up there and it's dark in the shadows and you can hear them growling on one side and growling on the other. And you think you saw a shadow just start to move and you think you saw a shadow. Come on, y'all are seeing the picture. And you think you saw a shadow on the other side and they're getting closer and closer and you know you can feel the fear starting to come on you. That's the greatest work of the enemy is the fear factor. He's trying to approach you with fear so that you won't use your faith. He's trying to approach you with strife so that you won't stand in agreement. He's trying to break down your discovery of who, your mission so you'll be caught in comfort level instead of your mission. And if you're caught up in comfort level, you miss the things of God. He's called you to discomfort. He's called you to close calls. He's called you to narrow escapes. Somebody said, well, I just narrow, I barely escaped. That was the Lord. He happened to be there, pulled you through. I just barely got through this. Glory to God. I, I love to hear people say it like this. It was the last place I looked. Well, that'd be idiotic to keep looking after you found it. Come on. Of course it was the last place you looked. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> You're called to narrow escapes. You're called to dangerous environments. You're called by the Lord to deal with the situation. Because as long as you live on this earth, there's wolves. You're a sheep called among wolves, but he said, I'm not leaving you, and I will not forsake you. 
I'll stand right with you and I'll be your good shepherd. You get into a situation, shake it off. It's not about you, it's about me. Shake it off. Don't let that thing harbor in your mind. Don't let that thing keep you from a restful sleep. You better trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. Don't try to figure it out. In every way, acknowledge Him. He's going to make your path stay on the mission level everywhere He's called you to go. Amen. Shake it off. Otherwise, you think you're in a mission of comfort. And when the wolf comes against you, stay your purpose. Stay on your purpose. Stay on your purpose. You know, most people come against the wolf and they back away. I won't do that anymore. I'm not going there anymore. I'm not going to do that ever again. I'm not going to do that ever again. I will not ever say that again. We have a consistent word out of our mouth to try to avoid the confrontation. But the Bible says you're called among the wolves. A sheep among the wolves. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Amen. Matthew chapter 6. Glory to God. Anybody getting anything? Is it helping you? All right. Matthew chapter 6 says this. Wherefore I say to you. This is a biggie. This is right in the word. Matthew chapter 6. Do not worry. <laughs> Whoa. Do not worry. Take no thought, it says. Take no thought. What you're going to eat. What you're going to drink. What you're going to put on. Life is more than food. Life is more than what goes on your body for clothes. Here's what he said. Take no thought. Take no thought. Take no... You know what the devil would like to do? Keep your so occupied in your thoughts. How are we going to do this? How are we going to make it? What are we going to eat? How are we going... What am I going to wear? You stand at your closet like this for 45 minutes. What am I going to wear? <laughs> what am I going to wear? At the same clothes that was there yesterday. What am I going to wear? What do you mean? What are you going to wear? You're going to put them clothes on. Some people don't have any trouble putting on some clothes. I just put on whatever I could find. Yeah, we noticed. But you, you can look in there and grab something that at least matches. My wife said, I got a match. You put something on that matches so that you at least look decent. Now, not quit concerning yourself with what you look like and concern yourself with the mission. Amen. The purpose of God. You got to pay it no attention. The devil's doing everything he can to get your thought life away from focused on the things of your purpose, on the things of your mission. So pay it no thought. You're called on a mission. Focus on what he called you to do. When you're focused on what he called you to do, he said all things all things will be added unto you. Look at, at Matthew chapter 6. Snatch your mind back from being trapped in the things of this world. Snatch your mind back from thinking of the thoughts that can try to control you and get you away from your purpose. Matthew chapter 6 look at verse 33. He said, but seek first the kingdom of God. In one translation says it like this. Seek first his purpose. Seek first his mission. If you're seeking the kingdom of God, not only you're doing this, because he said, let his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know that you're still called to the same mission in heaven? He called it in heaven before it's going to manifest on the earth. He said, let the same thing be done in heaven like it is on earth. Let it be done on earth like it is in heaven. He wants you to, boot, to do your mission. The purpose you've been called to do, he said, I'll reward you and let all the things, the clothes, the, the stuff will all come. Instead of worried about the stuff and thinking about the stuff, you've been called to a purpose. If you're thinking about the purpose, all the stuff will come. If you're to so tied up trying to make money, you're so tied up trying, trying to make your house payment, you're so tied up, tied up trying to make sure everything's okay, you'll miss your purpose and you still won't have enough. If you focus on your purpose, you'll have more than enough and you'll walk around saying, I'm just doing what the Father told me to do. I heard His Word and therefore I can do it. Amen. Amen. He said, I'm trying to bring you something. And when I was praying about this particular verse, he said, I've already arranged something for you to come. This stuff's going to come to you. He said, all things, seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added. I said, Lord, what things are going to come? He said, houses. He didn't say house. He said, houses, lands. I'm going to give them to you. And he said, I said, Lord, that's really good. How's that going to happen? He said, it's not for you to have to know, but he said, I'll just tell you a little bit. I've already called widows and ravens to take care of you. 
He said, I can do it. I'm big enough to handle this. I don't even need other people. I called widows and raven. I called raven. There'll be an enormous power that comes from on high. People don't even know why this is happening. You ever had somebody say, I don't know why I'm doing this? Yeah. God does. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing this, they say, but they'll give you something. We had a heathen man tell us one time, we were out of money. We were running, not, we weren't low, we were out. We were out of money. We didn't know what we were going to do. This, I mean, people had come to our rescue so many times. Good Christian people come to save us, help us out, save us. You know, you pray them, save me prayers. You ever prayed them, save me prayers? Oh, Lord, save me. I'll, I'll serve you the rest of my life. You know, most people don't mean that. Uh, they, they, get, they get it taken care of and they go, well, I forgot about it. But we were praying them, you know, them foxhole prayers. We're praying, save me, Lord, oh, save me. And Lord was sending miracles but people. And finally I said, Lord, we got to have something a little more established, you know, we're having to run off miracles. He said, I'm going to show you. I'll show you a great miracle that just won't cease. Had this heathen man call me up. He said, I'm going to give you some money. I said, okay. He said, uh, how much is your house payment? I told him. He said, how about I bring you $1,000? So he brought me $1,000 that week. He said, I don't know why I'm doing this. This heathen man. Give me $1,000. I said, well, pray. This is what I said to him. He said, you want to come pick it up or you want me to bring it over? I said, well, when people give me $1,000, they're not going to bring it to me. <laughs> he drove over the house and gave me $1,000. The man kept it up for 26 weeks in a row. You might say, well, wow, that's a miracle. That was the hand of the Lord. He said, I'm your shepherd. I can get people to do stuff. They don't even know why they're doing it. He'd say every week, I don't even know why I'm doing this. And he'd give me another thousand dollars. I don't even know why I'm doing this. I go, mm-hmm, I do. <laughs> and he'd give me another thousand. Kept it up for 26 weeks. We got completely out of the hole because if we only had $1,000 going out, the Lord said, look, I'm going to give you more left over. You can tie and give offering, help people do stuff. This is going to be the word of the Lord to you. And he gave us this money. Hallelujah. He said, I can take care of you. It's harvest time. When I was in the middle of prayer, he said, I want you to get ready. Say this out of your mouth. It's harvest time. Come on, say it. It's harvest time. It's not only the spiritual harvest that he's standing there and he told the disciples, can't you see the harvest is ripe? It's white. It's ready. It's ready. He said it is a spiritual harvest, but there's a physical harvest as well. I'm trying to get you the wealth of the sinner that's been laid up so it'll come to you the just. Amen. He said, I'm transferring wealth at this time. It's called a spiritual and a physical harvest. I'm bringing this so you'll be prepared for the end time revival. Because if you don't have yourself ready, they'll not come. You got to build the building and you got to be ready and you got to be prepared on the grounds and you got to have some things. You got to get ready and I'm going to supply you to be ready for the end time revival. So he said, I'm going to harvest. You're going to be called the reapers. He said, this is what I call you. He said, I'm going to call you the reapers. And here's what I told him. I said, Lord, I don't like that real well. And he, I said, because that could be misconstrued. You're the reapers. He said, oh, then put it like this. He said, then you're the reaping crew. I said, I got that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I got that. He said, you're the reaping crew. How many would say that with me? I'm on the reaping crew. I'm on the reaping crew. Here's what he said. Don't let this harvest pass you by. You're the reaping crew. Amen. Don't be distracted. Stay on your purpose. Stay on your mission. No matter what it looks like, shake off anything that's not of God. Root out anything that's not of God. Shake it off. Get rid of it. Don't fight with those that are supposed to be agreeing with you. It's the power of agreement. It's the very thing that you need to change the situation. Amen. You are his sheep. You're not to fight with the sheep. You're to be among the wolves and let him do the fighting. Amen. You weren't called to fight the wolf. You were called to be a sheep. You got little teeth. You're not to bite back. You're to let the shepherd hit him on the head. Amen. You are the sheep. Let's shake off anything else. And take no thought. Take no thought. Take no thought. How come? Because the curse of this world is the cares of this world. 
You carry around the cares of this world. Oh, my children. Oh, my Lanta. Oh, come on, you got a problem somewhere and you're just carrying this thing. If you're carrying the cares of the world, shake it off. This is shake it off. Don't let this thing stay with you past today. I don't care what they're saying. I don't care what they're doing. You shake it off. You are the reaping crew. And he said it to me like this. And the job must be done. Amen. Amen. Psalms 126 and verse 5 as we close. That's pretty good. Psalms 126 and verse 5. Those who sow in tears. You know that it's a lot of work to sow. That's a lot of work. But he said if you reap, if you're part of the reaping crew, you will reap in joy. Here's what's missing most people that are reapers, called to be reapers. We've been called to be the reaping crew. You don't have enough joy to reap. Don't have enough joy to reap. Because you're too concerned about what you've got to sow next. You're making this payment, but you're thinking about the one that's got to be due again next month. Come on. Because you can't get the joy level over to God t- taking care of you now and meeting your needs now. You're thinking about, what about two weeks from now? I'm going to need some more milk. I'm going to need some more milk. God's saying, I'm telling you something. Quit it. Shake it off. He has taken care of you all the way. He will continue to take care of you. God that has started a good work in you, he'll continue it till the day of Jesus Christ. Shake it off. You've been called to be reapers. Praise God. It's reaping time. Don't lose your joy. Build yourself up in joy. How do you get more joy? Come on. How do you get more joy? He said it like this. In the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. You enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. You enter into his courts, into his presence with what? Oh my goodness, you know exactly what to do. And if you're not praising him, that means you're not worshiping him. Mm Mm-hmm. It takes worship. You've said it in the New Testament. He says it like this. Rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. You've got to rejoice in the Lord always. And he said for those that missed it the first time, again, I say rejoice. If you're missing the rejoicing time, your joy level's dripping down. Come on, it's about to fall out. You got to rejoice. Somebody said, well, I don't praise God so good. You know what? Raising your hands is a start. There's all kinds of ways to raise your hand. Come on, there's there's the the low raise. Come on, you know what? You've seen this before? There's the one-handed praise. Come on. There's the field goal praise. Come on. You got to do it. You just got to praise the Lord. Even if you hold up one hand, you just praise the Lord. He said, start praising the Lord with your heart. Then if you're going to sing, this is a joyful thing. This is a praise unto the Lord. This is a worship God. You praise him with your mouth and the singing comes along with it. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. When you're happy, when you're extremely happy, When you're beyond just getting by happy, you're extremely happy. You break into song. You break into song. What the Lord says is, if I see the song on you, I know you're broken into joy. Amen. Somebody said, well, why should I praise the Lord? I mean, I'm here, aren't I? Yeah, but you need to praise not for him, but for you. You praise for you. Because the devil looks at you and says, wait a minute. This guy's in the presence of the Lord. I can't mess with him. Mm. So people that praise day and night, they pray in their car and they praise in their car. You know when you're driving in your car and you're concerned somebody's going to see you, you know, praising God or singing to God? That's just a fallacy of the devil. I've heard people say, well, I can't pray in the car. I do like this. You know, when I'm out and among people and I have to pray over my meal, I say, thank you God for the food. Amen. <laughs> He didn't call you to be a a silent partner. He called you to pray. You pray. You stop. I got a friend that says like this. He stands up and he clinks the glass. And he says, excuse me everybody, we're going to pray. Bow your heads. (laughs) And they do. It's not because they're being dishonorable. They're being honorable. Because people know if you want to pray, then they better get quiet. Amen. And you need to pray and rejoice. If you're praying in the car and somebody pulls alongside and they see you praying, just do like this. (laughs) And they'll think, well, you're listening to the radio. (laughs) Amen. 
So praise the Lord with your mouth. Don't let anything stop you from praising. This is the devil trying to keep you off your mission. If you're not full of joy, you won't be a reaper. The mission we've been called to is reaping. Get into the reaping. Every other thing will be added unto you. And he said, I'm going to show you what your exact purpose is. If you don't know your purpose, I don't care if you're 13 or you're 300. You need to get the purpose of God. What's he called you to do? Stay on the mission. Stay on the purpose. He's going to show you and you'll receive it. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we will reap in joy. We shake everything else off. We shake everything else off. Nothing, nothing, Father, nothing will stop us from staying on purpose. No matter what it looks like, no matter what people say, no matter, Father, if folks try to argue, we'll be quiet and we'll not let the argument continue because it takes two to argue. We'll stop it. We are sheep, Father, and we count on the Good Shepherd and we'll not let ourselves be caught up in the thoughts. Lord, we... Take time to honor you, that you handle this. I pray, Lord God, today that each person here is a reaper. We're part of the reaping crew. Lord, that end time harvest of souls needs an end time harvest of money to bring in the souls. And Lord, we receive that from every area. From inheritances, to money that just been given to us. From secret money that was just held up by the sinners. Laid up for us. We receive that. And all the cash that you promised, Father, we take it now. To prepare for the mission. Prepare for the purpose. I pray, Lord God, that we, even in our level of discomfort with understanding and our discomfort with, with where we stand, we will not be discomforted with our physical bodies. Because, Lord, you called us to healing. We receive our healing now in Jesus' name. Healing, I command you to come in this room even now. There's some folks in here today that are standing fast for their healing. And I'm going to pray and agree with you for a healing. Some people have said, I need a healing with my shoulders. Now, you say, why are you just praying a prayer of agreement and not laying hands on us? I'm telling you why. This is the power of agreement. And right now, you need a healing in your shoulders. If that's you, put your hand right on your shoulder and get ready to receive that healing. There's some people that are dealing with your hands. I can't get away from this. It's even in your hand right now. You feel like something's not right in there. And God says, I'm going to heal that hand. Would you receive it? Will you be made whole? Healing for your hand, I command it to flow in the name of Jesus. Healing for your shoulder, manifest now in Jesus' name. Healing for your teeth. Right now, your teeth have not seemed right. All right, now in the name of Jesus, put your hands up to your mouth. To teeth, I command you to line up with the word of God. We root out everything that's not of God and command it to come in line. We shake off the thoughts that we're going to deal with this. And right now, I command the healing to flow in these teeth in the name of Jesus. And where there was not caps, there'll be caps. And where there was not straightening, there'll be straightened. And where there were cavities, they'd be filled in the name of Jesus. Healing come to your eyes right now in Jesus' name. Put your hands on your eyes. Those that need healing for your eyes. Healing come to your eyes. Straighten up. I command your eyes to be 20-20 in the name of Jesus. Even though your body has been de demanded by the devil to deteriorate, your eyes will not be dim in any way. They'll be seeing well in the name of Jesus. Healing flow in your body right now in Jesus' name. And I pray for legs. I pray right now. Some people have stretched your calves. You feel that stretching in there. It's just, it just hurts when you bend a certain way. I say right now in the name of Jesus, be healed. That healing flow in your body. You can bend over. You can squat. You cannot hurt when you do that in the name of Jesus. It feels like you worked out too hard. I'm telling you what. The healing come in your body right now in Jesus' name. Ankles, I come command you to be healed. There's ankles that are just twisted and not feeling good in the name of Jesus. And now he said even toes. He said pray for the toes. There's some people here that think they got gnarly toes. I say in the name of Jesus, in Jesus name be healed. Toes straighten out. Quit it. And where you've been hurting I command you to be healed in the name of Jesus. Healed in the name of Jesus. 
Now some people need to put your, ear, your hands up to your head right now, right on your ears. Ears, I command you to be open and hear properly in the name of Jesus. Where there's been a, a lack of hearing, I command it to be open. Hear clearly now in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you. Back's healed right now. Somebody needs to put your hand on your back. You can tell right now in the name of Jesus, your back is straightening up. It's popping right there. Oh, right there. Right there. Healing in Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you for visiting our service this day. And for the word of the Lord to us. We receive it, Father. And we thank you. We shake off anything not of God. Heal our body. Visit our lives. Glory to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.